Hello, everyone. Welcome to Life with God. Tonight, we begin season two of this program entitled God is Presence. For this first episode, we have invited Dr. Kenneth Berglund to speak to us and with us about uh, God as presence uh, in the Bible, but also from personal experience. Um, Dr. Kenneth Berglund has graduated with a PhD from Andrews University a few years ago and is currently pastor in Norway. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for accepting my invitation. I'm so delighted to have you as part of this first episode of season two. Welcome. For being invited. Also part of the discussion, we have uh, Joseph. Welcome, Joseph. We have Kian. Welcome back, Kian. And Austin, welcome. As usual, we take five minutes to get to know our guests. And so I'm going to time our questions with this hourglass. If you were to have a wild animal as pet, which animal would you choose? I think clearly it would be a monkey. Uh, what is your most favorite food? Um, well, we just ate lasagna, uh, and that's probably on my, one of my top. <laughs> Fruits or vegetables? Fruit. What was your hometown like? I've had uh, 25, but uh, <laughs> um, it was a quite small village. Uh, what is the cherished memory of your mother growing up? Um... I think sort of just coming home and seeing her in, in the door greeting. And that's sort of, uh, yeah. What is your favorite genre of music? Um, I like different types of music, of course, from, from classical to more modern music. Um, but pref I prefer the more simple, maybe one person singing, one person um, on an instrument. Simplistic. How many languages do you speak? Probably just speak two. Uh, what are those? English and Norwegian, so at least fluent. What is one thing you get enthusiastic about? When I can create something. Uh, um, yeah. What do you like to create? Well, uh, when it is a challenge, it doesn't uh, sort of. Um, um, as long as I, you can, I can use the more creative uh, imagination. Um, and, um, but um, yeah, one example is at least uh, photography. Uh, I do a lot of nature photography. So, What is your favorite Bible character? Well, of course, uh, many. Uh, immediately, I was thinking of uh, Job. Uh, Job was quite important for my part. Uh, which teacher influenced you the most and why? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think I've just many teachers, um, but, but I think sort of uh, the teachers that influenced me the most at least were the, those who went beyond the more academic uh, and sort of could show the more personal uh, mm -hmm. meaning of uh, what we were talking about. So, mm -hmm. What kind of books do you like to read? Um, from poetry to philosophy to um, more existential readings of the Bible. Do you have a favorite place from your travels that you would like to that you'd like to visit again and again, or you would if you could? Yeah, probably uh, two, two places immediately I'm thinking of. One is Iceland, uh, the other is um, Sardik in Sweden, which is our the Scandinavian answer to Alaska, uh, as they mm -hmm. call it. <laughs> uh, what is one book that most affected your life? Of course, the Bible, uh, clearly. Uh, the Bible has been sort of... Uh, uh, different dimensions of the Bible, but uh, yeah. Would you say your baptism was your own choice or was it influenced by your parents or your peers? It was my own choice, but um, I think I had my spiritual awakening after my baptism. Um, yeah. What is a family tradition you have? Um... <laughs> 
Well, when we get together, we uh, we like to discuss politics and um, philosophy, uh, theology. So that's uh, yeah. What is a favorite thing in nature? An animals, uh, especially the deer family. So I've done a lot of uh, sort of photography on on deer, uh, moose, elk, and reindeer. Yeah. What is your favorite color? A uh, two. It's orange and. Um, Spring green. Um, do you ever get writer's block and how do you overcome it? Well, I don't consider myself uh, that much of <laughs> a writer, but uh, of course, sometimes uh, you're just stuck, but it's not because I'm trying to write, but it's in my thinking I get stuck. So, yeah. Would you rather vacation in a small city or a big city? Clearly in a small city. Maybe even outside the city. So, <laughs> awesome! Thank you so much, Kenneth, uh, and thanks everyone else too. We appreciate knowing you a little more. Um, you are our guest today on um, Life with God in season two, studying God's presence. Um, our first season was about love, and while I was intrigued about the concept because it's so important, I, in some way, am even more intrigued about presence because I feel like it's a concept we don't understand as well. We haven't dwelt so much uh, on, on, on the idea on uh, the presence of God in our lives or in the universe, you know, how he manifests his presence or his absence or things of that nature. So I'm really intrigued uh, for this whole season, uh, especially for this first episode, because we'll just, we'll just begin the discussion here. And so I'm curious where you will take us uh, with the conversation. I trust God uh, to um, guide uh, our trajectory. And so um, I guess to open the conversation, I would just ask a broad question and um, we'll see where, where we go from there. Um, how have you experienced uh, God's presence uh, or what were some of your life experiences in regards to that, to this concept of God's presence? Um, maybe some uh, struggles, um, how did you overcome them? How did you, how did you find God as a present God in your personal life? <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, um, when I was around 17, 18 years, sort of I, I started very much sort of this search for God's presence. Uh, I'd grown up uh, as a, in, in a Christian family, Adventist family. Um, but then I felt, well, I really need somehow an encounter with God in order to uh, base my uh, life and to live, um, give him my whole life. Um, so um, from 18 years, uh, I had this uh, search for God's presence. And often I use the metaphor of the burning bush. I was searching for the burning bush, mm -hmm. some kind of experience with God that could be the basis of a life of faith. Um, and the irony or the paradox for my part was that the more I searched for God's presence, um, the more it disappeared for my part. Uh, so year after year, and God just ended up being further and further away from, from my part until I was 25. Um, sorry, 24, uh, and I decided I probably just need to, to give up faith because I'm not able to find God. Mm. Um, I will, I'm not able to find the burning bush. Um, and so I put on my clothes. I said I won't return until I made a decision, either sort of for God or against, um, very much knowing that I probably would return as a nihilist, uh, giving up all kind of meaning. Um, so I went for three hours walking and it was this per perfect scene with wind and storm and everything outside, but of course, reflecting very much how I was feeling inside. Um, and what I've, what happened, uh, during that walk was that, um, I realized that I've been searching for the burning bush outside as an external experience. Um, but I, as I was clearing out God, the church, meaning, everything in my life, I just realized that it was one thing that I couldn't get rid of uh, and still be honest to myself. And that was how 
I become so impressed with the character of Christ that it was something unique with his personality and character. Um, and I wouldn't be able to be honest and just re reject him. Um, and reflecting upon that, uh, that experience, I realized that I've been searching for God's presence outside of myself. Um, so much so that I've been become blind to uh, seeing that he had actually grasped me inside. So I was trying to find God, but he'd found me already in a way. Uh, I was searching for God, um, so much so that I didn't see or perceive that he'd found me already. And for my part, that became very much a turning point uh, in, my, in my faith uh, as well. And uh, um, still a lot of questions uh, relating to God's presence, but um, um, yeah, uh, sort of, I think that sort of marks um, for my part, uh, this struggle with God's, God's presence uh, in my life. I'm very intrigued by something you mentioned um, that you were searching for God outside and yet God had already found you on the inside and yet you were not quite aware of it, it seems. A um, cu couple of questions, um, if, you, if you can answer, but how, would you, how, will, how were you searching for God outside? Like, what is that? Like, where? Where would you search for yeah. God? Well, uh, um, at that point in my life, uh, sort of, I, I discovered nature. <laughs> So I would go very much outside. I would be um, be alone in nature. Uh, I would climb up uh, on mountain tops and cry to God, uh, shout to Him. Uh, it was this sort of the need to be alone very much. But then, with with nature and maybe bring my Bible. Uh, so it was nature and Bible. I was sort of trying to. I needed time alone to um, to wrestle with God uh, in that uh, environment. So, um, so yeah, it, it, was, um, it was very much um, a time where I went for long walks <laughs> over days and weeks uh, as well. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and that went on for a few years. I it think. went on for seven years. Seven years. What made you not give up? Well, um, to me, it was um, this existential question of uh, meaning or not meaning in life, uh, life, death, uh, sort of how, what, what, is, what is the basis of, uh, that I can live from? So it, was, it wasn't sort of just an intellectual struggle. It wasn't just a cultural or traditional struggle. It was a struggle for my life uh, in a way. So, um, so I wanted to give up many times, but I just felt I couldn't. Um, and I think as well that uh, God was holding me up uh, during that time um, because I think he, he saw the beginning from the end and he saw that, well, poor Kenneth uh, needs seven years before he can really get, get the point. Um, so um, it taught me also uh, sort of... Um, a dem that God is a robust God. Uh, he, he knows where we are. He knows what we need. Um, and even if it was tough, I just realized that uh, what I ended up with was far better than what I'd been searching for uh, mm. as well. So. so I have like a very simple question. It's just like, um, can you give an example of what was your, what was your wrong idea of search? It's like, what was that external experience that you are looking for? Because so I don't know if that will be equal for every individual, but I, I just want to know, like, what is it like that it might be a wrong, wrong way yeah. to search for God? Uh, well, uh, I used the metaphor of the burning bush. And of course, it's a metaphor because I didn't know how God would possibly reveal himself uh, to me. But it was this idea that um, God's presence is um, himself revealing his being uh, in, in spatial proximity. I can experience it. Uh, it is um, um, when, when I encounter God, it's also sort of encountering his favor. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so I think it's a cluster when often when we talk about God's presence, it's a cluster of ideas that we bring with us. Um, and I was searching for this idea that I've been taught of how what God's presence is. And to me, the, the process was also to de-learn what God's presence is in order to maybe relearn more what the Bible is uh, or how the Bible is speaking about um, God's presence, because I think it's often a difference. Um, so now I don't necessarily talk that much about God being near uh, as we usually uh, usually do, but but I prefer to speak of God being with, because uh, as far as I see, that's the more biblical way of speaking of um, the idea we often call his presence, um, that God is with us. Um, uh, and I think that's something different than God being near the way we usually def uh, describe it. Mm -hmm. I'm so, not sure if it makes sense, but... Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, so in, in some way, uh, I, I had friends who maybe had slightly similar experiences, and I, I remember them desperately wanting that nearness that closeness with god in some cases they were expecting um god to they were asking god to show himself to them in a specific way um and i, I think that can be a little tricky too i mean god of course understands the unique situations of every person and i think he honors the honest the honest search uh, but at the same time um it's possible that sometimes we may we may control god without realizing uh, not suggesting that was um Part of your experience at all but well, it, uh, I, I was trying to control god uh, i believe so yeah so. um and of course he doesn't want to be controlled for for our sake primarily uh, because he wants to reveal himself to us in a different kind of relationship um yeah it, that would start in a d different way start from a different foundation and then build on that foundation um kenneth you you seem to have uh, done some research in the bible uh, this is what I hear you talk about, uh, that you've discovered God in the Bible is God with us. What, what, what have you did? What can you share with us about your, your biblical findings? Yeah, so, so I did this search trying to find the idea of God near in the Bible. Okay. Uh, and the way we usually define it, I could find maybe sort of, I could count them maybe on my fingers the uh, the verses in the bible that matches the way i've been taught to think about god's presence mm -hmm. um but then i tried to search for the idea of god with and i came up with over 2000 uh, hits uh, on that idea it sort of it it's just permeating uh, the bible this way of talking about god mm -hmm. uh, of course it's different prep prepositions maybe uh, being used but um uh, just sort of one example, one passage that I think is, is interesting for the question of presence as well. Um, Exodus 3, the burning bush episode, um, where we often think we are encountering um, uh, the I am who I, um, uh, I would, or I am uh, who I am. Um, uh, and, and this sounds like a very remote god he's just out there he's he's eternal he's timeless um uh, he's um he's really not dynamically interacting with our lives um but then um the the, the word um uh, um i think you can translate not only i am but i will be i will be the one i will be uh, and this word um, is used four times in the passage. The first time it's used is in an answer to Moses. Um, so where Moses asked, who am I to go to Egypt? And then God's weird answer is, um, uh, I will be with you. So that's the identity being given to Moses in that passage, that who are you that I will send you? Well, you, your identity um, is the one that I will be with. 
And I think this also defines what God means when we come read later on uh, in the passage that uh, I will be the one I will be. Uh, it's the covenant idea uh, where um, uh, God is promising to be with them. And then he gives Moses a sign. Um, so how can I know that you will be with? Uh, well, you will know when you're already standing at Mount Sinai uh, and worshiping. It's a sign given after the event. And if I was Moses, I would prefer to have this sign prior to the event. Mm -hmm. But God really says that, well, uh, to know that I am with you, you need to have the experience of looking back and seeing that I was actually with you. Uh, so theology, philosophy doesn't help. Um, you really need to have a life experience of a God being with. And I find sort of it interesting as well that when we then open Matthew, um, the promise of Emmanuel, um, uh, it's, it's the same idea, God with us. Um, and right before Jesus leaves, he's taken to heaven, uh, his promise is, I will be with you all, all days. Uh, so I think sort of this just shows the idea of, um, or uh, there are examples of the idea of what it means with God being with us. Um, so, um, so Jesus can be in heaven and he's still with us. Um, and I think sort of that's maybe a different way of thinking about presence um, than we often do, because we, I think we, we often maybe project the idea that um, for me to act, I need to be in, in this room. I, I can't do something now uh, at Andrews. I, I'm stuck in Norway, uh, and it's only here in Norway that I can act. Um, and so I think we have the same idea with God, uh, that he has to be physically present or present in his being in order to act. Uh, but I think that's limiting God. Uh, he can be the opposite end of the universe and act yeah, here and now. And that's sort of more the idea of being with. So I just, from what you have said, I just have an idea of like, does it mean that it usually, it is usually, um, easier for us to kind of understand that we can see God directly in the in present state it's rather more like future like you have to go somewhere else I mean you have to pass through times and then look back and you can see God is it more like that because like you just showed the same example of like Emmanuel or the example of Moses in Mount Sinai like his sign was afterwards right and then like that's a moment he kind of understand that God was with him and like or some kind of example story like um, Abraham and Isaac like when they went to Mount um, I think when they went to do the sacrifice they are so like I don't know if God was with them but at the end they noticed that God was with them like because everything was prepared so is it more like it's easier for us to understand that if we want to see where god is with us look back <laughs> yep. uh, and just mentioning that when god is making a covenant with abram isaac and jacob mm -hmm. he's again saying i will be with you that's the promise given to the uh, given to the patriarchs mm -hmm. um and i think you're very much right that well abram um when did he really know that god had been with him well, that was uh, when he was old, when he, he, he was standing with Isaac mm -hmm. in his hands. Uh, then he really understood what uh, God with meant. Um, and I think for my part as well, I was searching for a burning bush. Um, and say that God had lit up a bush when I was out in the mountains. Um, afterward, I, I know myself that well, <laughs> that I think I most likely would have become quite skeptical had I created almost a halluc hallucination by my intense desire for the burning bush. Uh, and I think sort of, I probably would have ended up doubting the experience uh, if I'd been given it. Um, but now sort of uh, leading me through these seven lean years, as I often call them, um, and seeing that he was there all along. But I, I was blind in my search for God because I wanted to find God in my way. Um, and so when 
when I'd come to the brink of giving up, then sort of uh, he was ready to step in and show that, well, he'd been there all along uh, anyways. So he'd been with, uh, even if he'd not been um, been near, if, if you're following the, the idea. So then um, what encouragement would you give people who have been seeking, they've been seeking long, it could have been months, years, and they see others having experiences and they're like, why not me? Um, this must be fake. This must not be real. How would you encourage them? What um, would you say to them? Well, first of all, I would say be honest about your experience. Um, I just wrote an article uh, with the title, Let's Confess That God is Hidden and Silent. Uh, because I think that's a dimension present, present uh, in scripture as well, um, where the prophets are discussing God's, God being hidden, God being silent. And maybe so sort of that is a more authentic ex encounter with God. So be honest with that, um, with your experience. I think the second would be um, be honest with God. So be honest with uh, other people, but also be honest with God. And just um, tell him exactly what you think. <laughs> of course, he knows it anyway. But I think we have the examples in scripture where, where the prophets and the patriarchs, they, they can be quite blunt, blunt with God uh, and just tell him to his face exactly uh, how they feel. Um, but also, I think the third would be um, don't give up. Because the search, what, what is at stake is, is so important. You probably can't, um, probably nothing is uh, uh, more important in your life. So just stick to it, even if um, the days can be quite terrible and quite painful. Um, and I, I can say it was a lot of tears uh, it, it was a lot of desperation through those uh, years for my part. And, um, but at least from, from me now looking back upon that experience, I would say it was worth everything. Um, but it was truly painful. Um, but sometimes I think we need to go through what is painful to to learn maybe some of the real valuable lessons in life uh, as well, so, yeah. I think I have a question somewhat based off of what Austin said, because he said some people search for God and they're still searching, they can't find him and you yourself, you said it took about seven years. Do you think how a person feels God's presence with them is a bad way to estimate how spiritual you are or how much you are close to him in terms of like spiritually do you think that's a bad indicator of someone's quote-unquote holiness it's a it's a good question because often at least sort of what happens in in a church setting is somebody stands up and says well i had an answer to prayer uh, another stands up says well i had an answer to prayer a third person stands up and says, well i had this amazing encounter with god and then you sit there and you just feel so empty. Mm -hmm. um, and at least where I am at this point, I, I think um, just to answer your question um, shortly, yes, I think it is a bad encounter or bad indicator uh, of your spiritual state. Um, it just takes some of the prophets. They were really struggling with the question of God's hiddenness, God's silence. Um, and um, well, if they had not sort of uh, really acknowledged that, uh, that aspect um, or that experience, uh, probably we would have large chunks of the Bible would be absent mm. um, because sort of their um, God would not have responded in that way mm. if they hadn't really gone into uh, that dimension of life, uh, life as well. So, um, so maybe sometimes uh, it 
I'm not saying that the opposite is true, that if you, you experience God's absence, that is a good indicator of spirituality, because I, I think that's a fallacy as well. Uh, so, but um, um, just being honest with life, being honest with faith, and being honest with God, uh, I, I think is important. However he chooses to reveal himself or not reveal himself. Uh, Awesome. So um, what we're trying to achieve in the program Life with God is, um, well, the, let me put it this way. The premise of the program Life with God is that this is a life worth living, that uh, the presence of God in our lives, the with in this concept, the relational aspect brings us something um, worth worth accepting, worth incorporating. And um, uh, in each season, we study one concept in God and see how that concept, the way it is manifested in God, enhances this relationship between us and God. What we're really learning, zooming in in this episode is the fact that it's an up and down, um, that it's a struggle sometimes. Uh, there are some, there are victories, there are low times, there are high times. Um, and I think that's just part of human experience. Uh, but I really appreciate the way you're um, inviting us into considering this, you know, by sharing some of your experience. Um, this uh, this up and down with God. Now, the interesting thing is that when you talk about God's presence, the way you presented it from your experience and from the Bible research is that you can't really have presence without relationship, uh, especially in, in the way you presented it as God saying, I will be with you. That's his promise. But then our present turns into into moves towards the future and then turns into past. And that's when we see God. So if we have this repeated experience with God, looking forward to the future where he promises to be with us, but then looking back to the way he has been with us, this is, to me, this sounds like a deepening relationship, uh, a, a constant building of trust in a relationship with God. So it's, uh, would it be fair to say that we can't really talk about God's presence in a personal way to us without relationship? Or can he be present um, without us being in a relationship with him, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, just if we take the example of the covenant idea, God is with his people, even when they're in exile, or even when they are um, worshiping idols and everything. So, uh, mm -hmm. so God is still in the covenant relationship with his people. Uh, so, um, so clearly, I think God can have a, a with relationship with us, um, even when we are not responding uh, to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that shows sort of um, God's love uh, in the topic of your the previous season. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, does that mean that, um, so God has covenant with the Israelites even when they were in exile, right? So does that mean that um, not it's not just for Christian or believers who have that constant relationship or constant covenant with God? It, does that mean that like everyone, every single person in this world is basically there with God right now because of that covenant? Yeah, well, at least sort of, I think um, the way God describes his relationship to humans and to, to creation is that he has a with relationship to them. So as a creator, he is with his creatures. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think you can say that he is with everyone. But then I think it is also sort of a, a covenant idea where the with becomes more intense, if you like, uh, where um, the with relationship intensifies. Um, and so, um, um, yeah, um, when we respond to God, I think that makes a difference for him as well. Um, because I think one of the things we need to get away from is the idea of God being unchangeable. Um, be, uh, for my part, at least, uh, the idea of presence, God's presence, was the idea of God being always there, uh, really not sort of interacting, um, almost lame, uh, always uh, giving his blessing, 
but it, it wasn't sort of some, somebody I could really interact with. Um, but I think with a with relationship, uh, it's a far more dynamic God we're encountering. Um, it's the God that is with the people both um, in the promised land, but also in exile. Uh, when they are uh, going to the temple of Yahweh, but also when they're uh, worshiping idols, because he has covenanted with them. Uh, so he has bound himself to them. Um, but, it's, um, but it's also then the God that is really passionate. Uh, and I think this is what we've, we encounter, God who is uh, crying like a, a woman giving birth, uh, as one of the prophets says. It, it sort of, it's in this intense passion um, uh, towards uh, humanity, um, and um, so, so I think we need to get more comfortable with the idea of God being uh, historical uh, and sort of uh, interacting um, in a very real sense in, in life. What I do really affects God, um, and it's a much more dynamic relationship than we often um, uh, describe it uh, to be, I believe. Um, yeah. I feel like I, I'm taking away so much questions. <laughs> I have just one more. Um, yeah, so, um, in in that sense, like, so when I write journals, I write journals like almost every day, and I have been doing that for a long time. And re just recently, I have changed my new books, so. At the first page, I always write like, you will not notice it, but at the end, when you look back to your life, you will know that God was with you. Like, that's always my kind of like a covenant and my first page of the journal. And I was thinking, and I always am confused about the about the idea of faith. Is that faith? Like, cause a lot of times I also recognize that like at the present, you don't really recognize where is God. Like sometimes I'm lost most of the time, but it is, it is always like afterwards. And when I look back, like I cannot deny that there was no God in my life. So is it, is that faith? Like you don't feel that God is with you like in presence, but like, you know, at some point <laughs> or. Yeah. One of my teachers, he used this uh, image of sitting in a boat and rowing. Uh, and then you have your back in the direction you're heading, but, but you're looking behind you and behind you, you see the, uh, the trace of the boat mm -hmm. uh, over the water. Uh, and maybe that's an image you can use for, for faith. Faith is like sitting in that boat uh, with your back to, uh, towards the future, but you can look uh, into the past and see how God was leading. Um, um, over the years and uh, uh, even uh, those times that were uh, the, the waters were a bit um, um, stormy or whatever, it, you had waves. Um, so even there, sort of you can see the, the trace of the boat. I think, I mean, the idea of perspective, um, we think of the past giving us perspective on a number of issues, aspects of our lives. And what I'm hearing in this conversation is it's no different with God. You need to have that perspective to, to be able to understand better different circumstances, different situations, um, to interpret maybe aspects of your life. Um, Kenneth, I, there are so many things we could, we could still talk about uh, and time is running. Um, I'm a little curious if there is, uh, you've shared some really helpful concepts about how the Bible portrays God as present um that i personally appreciate that i think would be helpful to reframe our thinking to help us yeah just think about it maybe differently than we have so far i'm curious if there is anything else from your research that you might um would be important for you to share um that you would find think would be helpful for us maybe any patterns in those 2000 verses i'm so curious there's this, there's so much richness there um what what else would you share with us well maybe one thing um, if we um, go back to the day when Jesus was taken to heaven, I think so sort of the disciples felt um, a painful absence 
if you like, so they've been spent the time together with Christ, suddenly was taken away from them. And what we see is that um, for, in the early church, you have this intense longing for Christ to return. This is what they talk about uh, repeatedly in the book of Acts and in the New Testament, that he will come back. Um, but when we read church history, we see that uh, as the church became established in the world, um, became a world power, uh, the longing for his return diminished. Um, and so um, the idea that um, God's, God was already present, he was present in the sacraments, he was present in the church, uh, in the uh, sort of the, uh, the priest, uh, priesthood uh, became, became elevated, um, uh, replacing uh, the role of Christ. Um, uh, and um, and uh, sort of the, the idea is that the more we feel that God is already here, the less maybe we are longing for him to return. Um, and I think sort of looking at the early church, we see this intense longing for him to return. This, I think, was also a key aspect of the early Adventist movement, um, uh, a real sense of or a desperate need for him to return. It was a, a feeling of a vacuum um, that we are missing something essential in our uh, faith life. Um, which maybe Christianity has tried to fill this vacuum in, in various ways. And, um, and sometimes I say when I go to church, often I hear um, people speaking of God being present here. We sing songs about uh, God being here. Um, but maybe, we, again, we should confess more that he is hidden and he's silent uh, because I think that gives uh, grounds for the longing for his return. Uh, so being more comfortable with the idea that God is with us, but he is still hidden, he's still silent, um, I think is um, a core aspect of Adventism. Um, so sort of as Adventists, we should be quite comfortable speaking about uh, God's hiddenness and his silence um, because this also again gives us the intense longing for his return so again it's this more historical relationship to um, to, to God and to Christ um, and acknowledging the real sort of vacuum right now uh, we just need him to come back uh, and we're not satisfied with anything until uh, we behold his face. So then how would you explain such a, an idea or a way of thinking to someone who's skeptical about God or about God's personality? Because they might think that, oh, if God is hidden from me, why would he do that if he's a loving God? And also people that think that God is the cause for the evil in the world, why would they want him to come back because they would think that if he comes back there's just going to be an even greater amount of evil so if he's if him being present is evil and him being hidden is evil it's just like two evils together so how would you reframe a person's thinking in that way who is skeptical yeah um it's a very good question it's, and, and this is i think one of the uh, the really challenging questions, uh, in, in, uh, not only to the question of God's presence, but um, but in general, uh, to faith. Um, and um, at least I think I would uh, begin acknowledging a skeptical person and, and many of the, um, the questions and the observations they, they have, uh, because... Um, um, atheists and skeptics have made some uh, true observations about reality and life um, that we, we are living in a mess um, there is evil um, and um, um, 
And also sort of, I think uh, maybe, maybe I'm just thinking uh, aloud now, but, um, but maybe I would continue speaking about the aspect of everything we don't know mm. and becoming comfortable with a lot of questions. It's not just uh, believers uh, who, uh, who's not able to answer a lot of uh, the real tough questions. Uh, I think we all are in the same boat on this. Uh, the real difficult questions. As humans, uh, we have um, challenges really answering. Um, so I think acknowledging also as a Christian, Christian that I don't have all the answers. It's a lot of uh, things with God um, that he has not revealed. Uh, what is hidden belongs to God, as, as it says in Deuteronomy, but what is revealed belongs to us. So. Um, so it's acknowledging that uh, difference also uh, between what we don't know, what we don't have revealed, and what we have re revealed. Um, but then, of course, uh, I think also a third aspect is, who is this God? Mm. Um, is it the evil God uh, that we uh, uh, sometimes suspect, uh, maybe? Uh, or might there be, be other possibilities? Uh, so I think sort of... Um, an open, honest question with a skeptic. Uh, I think we, we can do as believers um, and acknowledge many of the things that they are observing, but then reflecting together with them and walking with them <laughs> um, in, um, in this sort of faith, uh, the faith questions, life questions. Kenneth, you have um, it helped us, helped us a lot, uh, and uh, I know that you have also written a book uh, entitled "When You Come." It's in Norwegian. Do you have an English version of it? No. No. Okay. So I probably wouldn't be able to read that, but I'm really curious about well, the title itself. Um, and the question I have in my mind right now is, what happens when he comes? Hmm. What What is your experience with that? Um, usually it's su surprising. <laughs> okay. um, usually it's not the way that I had foreseen and imagined. Um, so, um, but usually uh, it's also much better. Uh, it, it's a much sort of better thing uh, when he comes uh, than one what I originally imagined. So uh, that's a brief answer. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. Surprising. Yeah, I think um, probably all of us can relate in some way to that if we have had uh, this experience with God showing up basically in our lives, uh, making himself present. Um, as we have repeatedly brought up, it's um, in, to some extent, it's a mutual relationship, even though he's always there for us. Uh, but it is also... Uh, um, it's also part of our responsibility maybe to how we want to engage or not engage that relationship. Um, and I believe that God is um, extremely patient. That is the way he portrays himself in the Bible as a long suffering, patient God. Uh, he doesn't pressure us. He doesn't rush us. He gives us the time and space to figure things out. Um, I think it's, it's helpful for us to, um, to engage in a process in a way that is real rather than rushing into a superficial relationship that at the end of the day we'll be disappointed with because we haven't really discovered who God is. So um, there's of course so much more we could, um, we could say on this, but I, I feel like you've really helped us with some direction of how to think about it, uh, both from your personal experience, but also from the scripture. I love the way you expressed uh, the, the appearance, the presence of God in the Bible as, uh, Someone, someone who is with us in the future, but that we have to understand with perspective, looking at the past, inviting us into a personal experience. Um, and um, I guess we could we could move into the takeaways um, at this point, unless anyone else has any other question. Maybe we can take still a, a couple of minutes for another question, if there is anything else that someone would like to raise. Uh, yeah, I think I have one. Um, you know, when it comes to God being with us and the time we seek to be with him, devotional time. Um, what have you found some important things for you that 
help you be more with the God who's wanting to be more with you. That's kind of a complicated way. Simply, um, how do you prepare to be with God in your, your time with him? First of all, I think uh, the, the with is uh, 24 seven. Uh, so it's not only in the devotional time, but um, still I feel that I'm not with him often. That, that's the major problem. Um, and so for my part, a challenge, but also the blessing is uh, to really just sit down and allow the silence. Um, sort of maybe outside, uh, outdoors, I prefer outdoors, uh, but also inside, um, just allowing the, the silent um, uh, reflection, uh, the dialogue with them uh, through scripture, but also sort of in the direct communication through prayer. prayer. Um, and again, just being, being honest uh, in that dialogue. Um, but often I need to get rid of a lot of distractors um, uh, because they are um, making it difficult for me to be with them. Um, so, um, um, yeah, so I need to be silent and, and not just outside, but inside myself. Uh, in order to uh, to connect better. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kenneth, and thank you to all of you for your comments and questions. Uh, let's move into takeaways. Uh, what is something that really stood out to you that you are taking with you from this conversation? Um, so for me, there are just so many things that I, I have to summarize, but there are so many things that I, I can take away from different subjects. But I think I have um, two that is major. Uh, one is in a point of um, more mystiological way. Like when you say that God is with everyone and that's basically he is in covenant with everyone. I have more, um, more confidence in sharing about God and I think it will be more, it's less scary to care about a person who, who might not like completely understand about who God is. But with that understanding, I feel like I can have um, more of a loving eyes to each individuals who, I think that's one of my takeaway. And the second point is um, trust. Um, I can trust that God is with me um, and I just have to continue my relationship even when I feel like not emotionally or physically or whatever, even when I feel like I'm not having with God or near God experience of what I kind of portrayed him to be. So I just have to trust and I know that he will be with me like as he promised. So that's my takeaway. My takeaway would, would be that the idea of God is with you and will be with you. And then when you look back at the past, you can see the instances of where he was definitely with you, even though he didn't realize it in the moment. Because I feel like, at least me personally, I have a lot of blinders on where I'm just focused on one thing and I can't really see anything external. And so that is where God is working outside of my blinders. And but when I look in hindsight, I can see, wow, God really did that. And then also what Kiyun said, that God is with everyone. I can use that as a witnessing tool to tell them, hey, what this event that happened in your life, where you were able to get out of that struggle, that was God's presence, God with you, and he continues to be with you. The point that struck me the most was how God gave the promise to Moses that it would be certain of his that his presence was with them only after everything had taken place, only after um, they had gone through the trial and are finally at the mountain. And it, it reminds me that this whole journey of faith is not about knowing um, how it's going to turn out, um, but it's about walking in integrity and just trusting, trusting God with the process. Mm -hmm. And like, I think God really wants to rebuild that trust with me. And um, that 
however uh, hard a trial may be. Like I can walk through knowing he is with me and I'll be able to look back. Like Kiyun said, look back and say, yeah, he was there all along and I'm not where I was before. He's brought me this far and start a new book, like a new journal and be like, all right, next chapter, let's go. Awesome. Um, I definitely resonated with everything else that you shared uh, with, with all of your takeaways. I would probably just add that um, maybe two or three things real quick here. The idea that God's presence does not equal God's nearness. I think that's very important, uh, especially in how we, ex how we feel. Um, there are times when I feel God closer, very dear to me, and there are times when I don't. But I believe that he's still present. I believe that he's constantly with me. And I think sometimes, I think that's just normal relationship. Um, there are boundaries of distance and closeness. I think it's the same with God. We try to, uh, yeah, um, that it, it's normal for God to be near in some time, in, in some moments and more distant, but that he's still always uh, with us in relationship with us. Um, the aspect of control that came up, I think is very intriguing. Um, and uh, there are ways in which we should not give up on searching for God's presence. But from what I'm hearing from you, Kenneth, is God really showed up when you gave up control, or maybe that was at least part of the experience. And I think that's something we struggle with as human beings um, often. Um, we like to be in control because that gives us power. It makes us feel, yeah, that we have some, some level of, um, it gives us some level of comfort. Uh, but I think in some ways it's when we give up that control uh, over God and over the relationship with him that we give him the freedom to show himself uh, to surprise us, right? When you mentioned when God comes, he will surprise you. I love that because it's unexpected. Um, and it's, it tells me that God wants to have a unique relationship with me and he's not gonna show up to me the way he shows up to someone else, maybe, because it, I'm unique and our relationship is unique. So he wants to surprise us with his presence in the way that he knows we need that presence, not in the way someone else maybe has experienced it. So that's that's also an aspect that I, I really appreciate. And I would invite people to, um, to consider that more. Um, it has definitely been a rich conversation. I didn't know what to expect at all. This is a subject I haven't studied. Um, just the fact that there are so many verses talking about it makes me feel much more intrigued. I, I want to know more. But Kenneth, you have given us a, a, some great direction of thinking about the concept. Uh, so I really appreciate you as a first guest on this season, you know, opening, opening up the discussion with, uh, with your thoughts, your expertise of the Bible, your experience. Um, and um, I believe that our viewers will be extremely blessed as we have been in this discussion. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kenneth. Thank you for opening up to us and, um, and spending the time with us. Um, thank you for, for the way that you, you receive, because it's challenging thoughts. Uh, and to me also, sort of my takeaway is the blessing just of talking about these things in a community. Um, because often sort of maybe we feel isolated and uh, sort of you know, maybe we can't talk about it. But just being able to talk about this openly and respect searchingly, uh, at least that's sort of a real blessing to me. So thank you uh, as well. Our pleasure, for sure. Uh, for those of us who are watching, we really appreciate uh, your time. We appreciate you giving us um, an hour of your of your day or your evening, watching the discussion, listening in, and hopefully relating to some of the things that were shared here. Um, and I would like to introduce real quick here the next guest. Um, Darius Yankovic will be um, our guest on Thursday, March 25. Uh, and he is a field and ministerial secretary for the South Pacific Division. Um, the perspective we will take in that episode will be historical. So Dr. Yankiewicz uh, is, has also been a professor of, of uh, historical theology at Andrews for a number of years before moving uh, back to Australia. So I definitely encourage you to attend that episode as well to, um, to, to, to follow it online. And um, of course, concluding this conversation, Kenneth, um, I would invite you to share with our viewers uh, some of your final thoughts on uh, the concept of God as presence. Well, I, I think just what I would like to say to the viewers is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, be honest about your experience uh, in life relating to these questions. Be honest with God about them. Tell, be open with Him 
uh, and ask him, uh, don't give up uh, as a third. Uh, ask him to uh, give you strength until you have a satisfactory um, answer uh, on it and you can move on. Um, but also sort of uh, accept that probably it's a lot of uh, questions relating to this that we will need to wait until we can ask him face to face um, and really understand how things um, were connected uh, in our life. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. I really appreciate I really appreciate your presence in this program. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Kian. And thank you, Austin. We appreciate your presence as well. For our viewers, thank you for being with us. And I hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye bye.